Greetings to our viewers. My name is Sharanam Vaswani, and I'm an editor at Judas Legal News and Commentary. We are joined today by Dr. Susan Adelman to discuss her book, The Rebel, a biography of Ram Jait Malani. Dr. Adelman is an author, a pediatric surgeon, and an artist. She has been an editor of the Detroit Medical News and a columnist for AM News. Dr. Adelman continues to paint and sculpt and has traveled all over the world. She speaks multiple languages and reads even more. The wealth of her wide ranging knowledge and experience is evident in her gripping yet easy style of writing that paints the portrait of a legendary man in intricate and unbiased detail. The Rebel, a book on the life of Indian legal luminary, Mr. Ram Jait Malani, arose out of Dr. Adelman and her husband's 40 year friendship with him and his doc daughter, Dr. Shobha Gehani, whom she knows from her days at the Children's Hospital of Michigan. Thank you so much for agreeing to join us today, Dr. Adelman. It is a pleasure to be speaking with you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Sharnam. Actually, it's better if you would say Edelman. <laughs> Edelman, I apologize. That's right, exactly. Well, uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether the people who are not from uh, South Asia have ever heard of the name Ram, Ram Jeth Malani. My husband, who's a law professor, just went emeritus at uh, GW uh, in, uh, in Washington, says that Ram was the greatest lawyer in the English language in the world. Uh, he um, was, uh, when, uh, well, we met him 45 years ago. And at the time that we met him, he was the chair of the Bar Council of India and already was a legendary lawyer. He had been, already had been teaching students. And in the early years when we first got to know him, he was extremely active in, um, in fact, being instrumental in founding the National Law Colleges of India. Uh, he had already uh, uh, developed political aspirations, which really came to fruition in the late 70s. And he uh, could be understood by people who are not from India as a lawyer, a politician, a legal educator, uh, and a, um, a character, <laughs> very much a character. <laughs> Indeed, we, any, any Indian law student upon entering law school hears, you know, legends about him and all of the great things that he accomplished. So I'm really looking forward to discussing your wonderful book. To begin, I think a question that strikes everybody is that you being a pediatric surgeon based in the United States, how did you come to know Mr. Jake Malani and what inspired you to write this book? So uh, when I was a fellow in pediatric surgery at Children's Hospital of Michigan, uh, Shoba Gahani, Dr. Shoba Gahani was a, a pediatric resident and uh, we had been to India once because I was fascinated with the beautiful textiles and materials. We were contemplating another trip and I began talking with Shoba and she said, oh, you should uh, call my father. Uh, uh, your, your husband's acting uh, dean of the law school at Wayne and you must meet my father. Very honestly, I never heard of her father. I wasn't interested. But when we got to Mumbai, I said, well, let's call Shoba's father. So we called and he said, oh, I'll send the car. And we came over to his uh, apartment and he was incredibly charming, his wife incredibly charming. And that was really the beginning of a lifelong friendship. So he being Ram, of course he took over the trip. Uh, he looked at all the places we were supposed to visit and he said, okay, now I'll send you to this person and to that person. And they were incredible people he sent us to. And after that, uh, we saw each other very often because he would visit Shobha probably twice a year in, in the Detroit area. And then we began going to India and he invited us several times. My husband taught with him. And then later uh, at my husband's law school, they developed what they called the, the George Washington University India Project. And this went for seven years. And each year uh, we brought a collection of uh, usually academics and practicing lawyers from a number of countries, always Germany, sometimes Israel, always Japan. Uh, quite a number of countries. And we would go there every year and have conferences and lectures and so forth. 
and often Ram uh, was, was part of that. He was always part of it in one way or another. So we saw him very often. And in the course of all that time, he would talk about the cases or the political events that were important to him at the time that we were speaking. And uh, I heard many of the stories that I later expanded into book chapters as informal discussions and had the sense of what was important to him. So much later, a biography of Ram came out, but this was uh, written by someone who was not really a journalist. And I actually had journalistic experience uh, from, from college and certainly didn't know him the way we do. And I felt like there was just so much more that could be done with, the, with this uh, biography and, and being a writer, having always been a writer. I, I felt that I could do it. I'd never written a book, but I felt I could do it. I'd never read a legal case. Ram claims, Ram claimed that I read 400 Indian Supreme Court cases. <laughs> I think it may be an exaggeration, <laughs> but I started out the first case. I, I asked my husband, okay, so now who's the defendant? Who's the plaintiff here? I can't figure it out. <laughs> so that was my point of departure. <laughs> but after that, uh, I began understanding uh, how these things worked. And in fact, once I had gone through many of these cases, uh, some of them were very, very prolonged, complicated cases. You read the book, you can see some of the ones I chose that were very, very, uh, they went back and forth, bounced back and forth to the Supreme Court and so forth. And um, frankly, uh, I felt like I needed to make sure that real lawyers reviewed my discussions. And I picked the six most complicated ones that I, I I asked Ram to do one or two. I asked his son Mahesh to go through one or two. I asked his partner Letta to go through one or two and uh, Jai Singh Hani, his former partner. So they all, they all, each of them went through one or two cases for me. And I was really, really thrilled that I got very, very little editing on the write-ups and particularly what Ram read, he, he virtually didn't edit at all. So I figured, okay, I've had a law course now. <laughs> That's really so commendable because uh, reading all of the cases, I think some of which we've had to read in law school as part of our curriculum, and they were just summarized so succinctly that, you know, it wouldn't occur to somebody that this had been written by someone who didn't have prior experience in Indian law, especially, which can get very gnarly and complicated. So, and it's also interesting to find out that Mr. Jake Malani was actually involved in the coming together of this book. So that well, definitely was, adds. Oh, he was totally involved. The whole family was involved. Shoba was very encouraging. Shoba almost commissioned the book. I mean, I told her I'd, I'd like to write it. She said, oh, yes, you must, you must. She recruited the family. I made several trips to India to talk with the family, uh, to interview Ram as a as if I were a reporter instead of a, a, a close personal friend. And I did formal interviews with him. I did formal interviews with Lata, obviously with Shoba, uh, with Mahesh, with Jai Singh Hani. I mean, just as the key, other people, of course, but these were like the key people. And uh, long interviews with Ram, it was uh, multiple interviews. And you can imagine he'd had people all the time waiting to get hold of him to talk about their case. And there, there would be people sitting on the lawn on, on, on chairs with tables waiting to catch him and say, oh, sir, please, if you'll just look, if you'll please sign, if you'll just this. And I had to kind of work my way in between all of these supplicants. <laughs> but it, it happened one way or another, it happened. I'm sure that must have been really a thrilling experience. So to get into it a little bit, was there a difference um, in Mr. Jake Malani uh, as a lawyer in his early years of practice as compared to his later years of practice? Um, I, a little difficult to answer that because I'm not sure what your intent is, but I think the main difference is just as he grew in experience and in, as he got older, I mean, look, he started as a young lawyer trying to make his mark. And near the end of his career, he was ter terribly senior. He was senior to all the judges because judges have to retire at 65. And his, his career uh, went on to over age 90. So some of them had been his students or his juniors, I had great respect for, that, for him. 
uh, one time uh, I was, was trying to catch him and the staff said, look, if you'd like, Ram's arguing a small case. Would you like to just go and sit and, and sit in the uh, courtroom and listen to him argue the small case? I said, okay, good, that's fine. So we went, it was a very minor point. Uh, and so we go into, uh, into court and word came out, Mr. Jeff Milani was arguing a case and young lawyers appeared from everywhere. And they, they came in, each as they came in would, would stop and kiss his feet. They would then sit, and then when they finished sitting and, and filling up all the chairs, then they were standing, they were standing in the aisles and in between rows of seats and so forth. And Ram would do his argument and he would do it. He was a showman. Uh, and he, he got great deference from the judges. The, uh, the, uh, the judge, um, Ram said something about, uh, are, are, we, are we breaking at lunchtime? And the, uh, the judge says, yes, we, we will break at, at, at lunch. And Ram says, well, I don't eat lunch. And the judge said, well, I'm not, I am not Ram Jethani, I have to eat lunch. <laughs> and then, then Ram said, well, he had to be in parliament and he had to leave at four, would that be acceptable to the court? And the judge said, whatever Ram Jeff Malani wants will be fine with the court. And then you could see him putting on the show as he argued his case and he would, he would always build it up. He would start with this point and that and so forth. And then he would start building to the thing he wanted to say with, with the, the pregnant pause stop and then he'd continue. And then as he got more into what he was gonna say, his voice would get louder and he'd bellow like an old lion. Uh, so it was quite a show. And he couldn't have done that as a kid, as a young lawyer. I mean, that's just not how a young lawyer behaves. A young lawyer just wants to make sure that people realize that he's a serious player. I'm sure, and uh, a lot of people will find this interesting, but as even I find, found out from the book, Mr. Jake Milani started practicing at the age of 18, which today would be completely unheard of. 18 is usually the age that we enter law school and start you know, studying the law. So it's amazing that that's where he started and we all know where he eventually ended up. So I think in the same vein, I was going to ask you to describe to me what it was like to witness an argument court, which you have done for us beautifully. But what were some of the legal skills and techniques that were really evident in his manner of arguing and, you know, things that he sort of kept in his repertoire and his arsenal when making his winning arguments? Uh, that's a wonderful question because there are really so many things that were really characteristic of, of Ram Jeff Malani, one of which was he, he knew every jot and tittle of the rules of evidence. He knew them backwards and forwards. And he could have a client who was guilty as all hell, but when they charged him, they made a mistake. They didn't get, they didn't get a, uh, they, they didn't get a, um, uh, something that a paper that they had to submit in exactly in time, or it wasn't in the right format, or the uh, the defendant didn't have the opportunity to, to read it, or it wasn't presented to him in his his own language, uh, or uh, heaven only knows what. But he could find some infraction with the way the police apprehended him and the way the papers were, and who and and uh, what what this person was allowed to read, so that he could he could disqualify many cases on the rules of evidence. However, not just that. He was so compulsive. He did all the details. He'd be up very, very early in the morning doing all the details. He did everything himself. I mean, he would, he would do conferences with other lawyers, but it, when, I, when I knew him, uh, he was already a senior enough that when he conferred with other, other lawyers, he was really just teaching. He really didn't need their input particularly. He would go through the case he knew the weak point and he said he always knew the weak point. He always knew where he could hone in. Uh, he was incredibly, incredibly well read. Uh, he knew not only the, the case, but he knew a lot around it. For instance, uh, as everybody knows, his, he was particularly known for criminal law, but he was a, one of these master lawyers who knew every kind of law. So my husband's expertise is patent law. And in one of their conferences, he asked Ram to be the, 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 the lawyer on one side and a, and a moot court, you know, a moot court. 
uh, and uh, there was a patent case, which is not Ron Zerio. He had about one week's notice. He came in to the moot court with a file this thick, with little, with yellow stickies sticking out of the file all the way, with a junior. He was prepared and he knew the relevant patent law. There's another, there's another example that I have in the book, which was an employment case. And the defendant apparently was an extremely lovely and uh, charming and, and, and attractive uh, young lady. And so Ron was heavily motivated to do a good job for her. He was not a labor lawyer, but the judge said that he gave the best labor law discussion in that court he had ever heard. In Ram's cases and Ram's election law cases, uh, one uh, thing that was at issue was Hindutva. For those who are not familiar with India, it's a long subject, but it is um, has something to do with Hinduism. It's not just exactly the same as Hinduism. Uh, and uh, he did that case, and he also did one case where, as he once described to me with great pride, this is a case where I argue that Hinduism is not really a religion. So he had, to, he had to go into Hinduism, into the caste system. And as one commentator said, before he started studying that for this case, he didn't even know what caste he was. But he studied that so brilliantly and he drew from references so widely that he came in as an absolute expert. So it's not just the procedural brilliance, which is he was a, I mean, he, he knew everything there was to know about procedural law in India, but it was the grasp of details and it was just the plain hard work. And he was funny. He was hilarious. Let me give you one, a, a case that my husband and I absolutely love. And that is um, the smugglers cases. So we had, there were a lot of smugglers. And one of the, one of the smugglers uh, smuggled scotch uh, to Karachi, from Bombay to Karachi uh, in a fast boat. And his friend said, what are you taking this case for? I mean, he's a smuggler. Everybody knows he smuggled scotch. Rob said, yes, yes, that's good. I'll take the case. So he goes into court and the guy, the, the, the police caught him, the scotch was in the boat. I mean, there was, a not, there was no question whatsoever. And after going through the routine, uh, preliminaries, the judge said, Mr. Jeff Milani, if you can find one good thing to say about this man, I will let him off. And Ram said, my lord, my client smuggles the very best scotch in the world. He let him off. <laughs> only, only Mr. Jeff Milani could do that. <laughs> yes. So um, I think the next thing that I would like to ask you in continuation is he had a fantastic work ethic. There was a lot of hard work. None of this just came out there once you read about the kind of work that he would put in waking up at 4 a.m. to study his cases and such. But what he was also known for, and this is covered across chapters in the book, is putting a unique spin on things or looking at things from a very unique perspective, uh, approaching things in you know a different and unprecedented manner. So are there some of these instances that you could recount for us in legal cases where he has used a unique lens. Okay. Um, can I can I read this one little section because it's a nice example. Of Absolutely. It. Okay. Ram says it's a matter of basic logic to project what circumstances will occur if what the witness says is true. Police once claimed to have seen a terrorist get out of a car and hand a bag of money to terrorists in another car. The police also described their location while they observed this action. Ram knew. It was at least a half hour walk from the scene because he had gone there to inspect both locations himself before the trial. In cross-examination, oh, he was brilliant in cross. In cross-examination, he asked, did you see them pass the bag of money while you were pursuing them or were you parked at the time? 
The police answered that they had been sitting in the police car parked at the location they identified. Rob asked, then how did you see them? All he had to do now was describe to the court the distance between the parked police car and the site of the alleged handoff. He said, all possible routes of escape have to be blocked first. So there was no, obviously they were sitting a, a half hour away. There's no possibility, they didn't see anything. But there, there were many, there were other, uh, it was another very funny one where, uh, oh, here's one. Uh, it says he learned from American lawyers to do something of investigation. Hardly any lawyer does that in India. In one example, the accused killer led the police to a well in which he allegedly had thrown a murder weapon. Police divers found a knife at the bottom of the well. Ram went to the scene and found a guard. He asked him if he was always posted there and whether he had seen the events of a certain date. The guard answered both questions in the affirmative. affirmative. He asked next whether the guard remembered seeing the police come to that location at any other time, or if he had seen the police for the first time on the day that the accused was supposed to have led them there. The guard answered yes, he had seen them come two days before. Ram asked how they had come. He said, in a Jeep, sir. On further questioning, the guard told Ram that the police had arrived and gone over to the well. He almost told me that they did something. Ram went to the police station, requested the log books for every police jeep, he found that a Jeep had gone to the scene two days before. What he put in the, when he put the case in court it was perfectly obvious the police had planted the evidence. Yeah, I remember reading that one, fantastic. So I think this is probably my last question about his legal cardio, but I found the chapter on fighting and defending corruption to be particularly interesting because it encapsulates the dichotomy that not just Mr. Jait Malani, but any lawyer faces in their career. Mr. Jait Malani forcefully opposed corruption, especially perpetrated by the Nehru Gandhi family on several instances. And people also then accused him on certain occasions of defending those accused of corruption. Uh, for example, the Ahujas and the Beaufort case. Mm -hmm. So how do you think that you know, he struck a balance of conscience and ethics in doing both. Uh, Ram points out that when he was the chair of the Bar Council of India, he actually wrote the ethical code that covered this exact issue. And the, the question is, he, he says, if you're a criminal lawyer, really, you're defending criminals, okay? So these are not, these are not the most upstanding uh, 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 citizens. Uh, and he says that a lawyer is ethically obligated to accept a case. He is not ethically permitted to turn down a case because the subject is a criminal, especially if he's a criminal lawyer. So he needs to do his best possible job for the client. Absolutely. So I think the next question that I have is, what would you say was the difference between Ram Jaitmalani, Ram, Ram Jaitmalani, the lawyer, and Ram Jaitmalani, the politician? You know, there actually was quite a big difference. Uh, the lawyer was, as I've described him, um, uh, meticulous, covered all his bases perfectly, uh, totally prepared, and so forth. Uh, the politician had a tendency to um, go on impulse, I think not often to do enough homework, uh, to have an angry reaction to something and, and uh, pursue that angry reaction, which I think often uh, defied common sense and would exasperate friends and family no end. Uh, I mean, there was one time that he made this silly run for president and everybody, everybody was mad. I mean, the whole, all, all of us, honestly, friends and family were complete. So what is the matter? What a stupid idea. But he'd, he'd get a bug in his head and he just would do it. But he would never do anything like that in the law. In the law, he was absolutely serious. And in, in politics, he often had a, a laudable point. Uh, for instance, fighting corruption. I mean, obviously, that's a very important objective. And he was right in that. Now, he wasn't right in every aspect of his fight, 
but in a lot of his political crusades, another one was was trying to get um, um, a, a judicial a, a process for judicial appointments. He was absolutely right on that. Uh, but some of the things he did in politics were just not well considered, honestly. I mean, I say that as a very dear friend. And that never happened. As far as I know, that never happened in the law. But how do you say that his time in law and as a lawyer influenced the work that he did in politics? Now, that influence did a great deal because uh, he there he would bring his he would bring his meticulousness, his knowledge of procedure of rules and statutes to Parliament. He would read the statue. Other people would be running off at the mouth about some nonsense. And he would, he definitely always had read the statute, understood it, knew the background, and could argue from a, a, a point of view of real knowledge, uh, uh, not, of, not of the dilettante that comes out and they read something in the paper that wrongly characterizes uh, the proposed piece of legislation. And then they start opining about it and have no idea what they're talking about. He never did that. He never did that. Uh, he, oh, I don't know, there's no such thing as never, I suppose. But I mean, at least in, in, in everything that I studied, uh, when he took a position, it was a position based on real knowledge, real knowledge of the issues, if it was a matter of legislation, of the legislation, and often of the people. And he really, he, he knew where the skeletons were buried, you know. So, when people came up and started, um, what can I say, talking very piously about something, he would know what the real story was about them. So, Dr. Edelman, do you think that there was a central principle that Mr. Jake Malani lived his life by? you know, something that we see running as a common thread from the start to the end? It's a little hard to answer. I think courage probably is one uh, and sense of humor is another. But when in, um, well, we might say in, in his legal practice, when it came to even these high profile cases, he would, he would take them. I think a good example of courage is when he defended two of the accused co-conspirators co in the assassination of Mrs. Gandhi. And he got tremendous opprobrium from the entire country and from parts of his own family. Everybody was furious, but he was right. He was right. They were not culpable. And the case against them was preposterously unbelievable. And, and we had gone through, I mean, I had heard about it long before I, I studied it in order to write this section in the book. And, and the, 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 the supposed proofs were, were completely stupid. And he was totally right. And when one of them was hanged, I remember, I remember personally uh, him talking with us and he was heartbroken, heartbroken that this innocent man was hanged. But it took great courage to defend an accused co-conspirator. Not only that, because the press either stupidly or willfully confused an accused co-conspirator with an assassin. And they portrayed it as if he was defending an assassin, which he never did. Now in, in, uh, in parliament, when he took these corruption cases, he went against uh, very major figures of the top figures in, in, uh, in, in, in the parliament and in the government. Well, he went against the whole Gandhi family. He fought the whole Gandhi family for corruption. And he had him, he absolutely had him. He was absolutely right. Uh, and the, the amounts of money that they found in overseas bank accounts and everything were astronomical. He knew that perfectly well because he had done the research and he knew that. So uh, that all took tremendous courage and uh, tremendous self-confidence. So uh, Dr. Aiden, since you brought it up, um his pursuit of the truth as far as the Gandhi family was concerned, especially in the Bofors case, was unbelievably interesting to read in the book, especially uh, the, the 10 questions that he would write in the Indian Express for 30 days. If you could tell us a little bit about that. Well, the, uh, the, the, the Bofors case 
was one of uh, the, the concerned Swedish arms that were purchased by the Indian government. The allegation was that there was corruption. And let me, I need to find my section on this because I need something I can read about. The, well, okay. I'd have to look it up because I was going to read a little section. But in essence, um, there was um, plenty of evidence that there was there was corruption involved in the purchase of arms from Sweden uh, for the use of of, uh, um, of India, and the Gandhi family was the the the, the corrupt entity. And Ram, I'm I'm hedging because I'm not going to read the part. Let me find it. Um, Oh, for okay, two fifteen. There was something that I like. Okay, so it was in nineteen eighty seven. Uh, the Swedish radio company broke it, claimed that the Swedish armaments company Bofors had paid bribes for a contract to sell howitzers to India. Uh, the Indian government denied it. Reuters developed the story saying Bofors had secured a $1.3 billion contract by bribing senior Indian politicians and defense officials, and that a 32 million Swedish kroner were transferred to secret Swiss bank accounts between November and December 1986. Everybody denied. Uh, in, on June 16th, Ramjet Malani openly accused Rajiv Gandhi of having received the Bofors kickbacks dared the uh, prime minister to prosecute him for libel if his accusation was false. This was a very important technique that Ram used. If there was any accusation against Ram, he always said, sue me. Said, unless you challenge someone to sue you, then, then how do I know that you really are innocent? Okay, now, uh, he then said that he would put in the Indian Express, which he worked with collaboratively, 10 questions a day for 30 days until Rajiv was removed from office. So the type of questions were, the first ones, one, has your wife informed you of the total estate left by her father who died early last month? Did he die testate or intestate? Does the estate include an expensive villa and a bank balance of more than $60 million? What was his financial condition and the approximate worth of his total estate only about five years ago? What were the sources of livelihood of your father-in-law during the last five years? What part of the estate has your wife inherited? What has happened to her share of the estate? Have you or has your wife reported the inheritance to the Reserve Bank of India? And so forth. Now, remember, he was addressing this to the prime minister of India and the wife of the prime minister of India. And these were about as impertinent and intrusive and private a set of, of questions you could possibly imagine in this one. And so in essence, what he did, if you took all these questions, they were, they were actually put together in a book. And one, one year, right around that time, I had a Sikh patient and the father brought me the little brochure and I don't know what happened to it so many years ago where the Sikhs had, had taken all this stuff and made a little book out of it. And if you read it, in the course of reading all those allegations, he's setting forth his legal case. Uh, and the, the public was just mesmerized because it was so, uh, was so cheeky. And they could read the case themselves by looking at how he designed the questions. Yes, I can't imagine how exciting it must have been just waiting for the next issue to see what the next set of questions is going to be. So that's that's fantastic. So this might be a little bit of a summary of the things that we've discussed before, but what would you say are some of the lessons that young people in law, in politics, in policy can learn crucial lessons from both his wins and his losses in life? Well, I think some of what uh, I might suggest is what I've already said, that, that you really, really, really have to know the law. You have to, 
be extremely detail oriented. Uh, you can't leave anything to someone else uh, in lieu of your working it out yourself. Now, if you wish to have someone else work on it, that's your business. But, but you need to really know your case and analyze it in extremely great detail. Uh, you should also know something else besides the law. You should have some idea of some philosophy of law. Uh, you, uh, it, would, it, it doesn't hurt if you happen to have a talent uh, for language and a flair for language, which he had, which is of course innate. Sense of humor also is helpful, which is innate. Uh, but I, I think, so I think in terms of, of working out a case, uh, it, it, he was also a lone wolf. I mean, he did not depend on, on uh, uh, juniors except for finding a statute for him or, or, or doing some, some very simple footwork, but he did the, the legal analysis himself. Now, in terms of how he designed his career, I'm not sure he designed it that consciously. He started out as a young lawyer and he knew, of course, he needed to develop a career. And in those days, the great lawyers worked on their own. Uh, and they didn't work in, in, in law firms. He never would have fit in a law firm. He wouldn't have, uh, he, he didn't suffer fools gladly. Uh, if someone came to him and told him some, something that was not tenable, he'd tell him it was rubbish. Uh, so I, I, I think it's really, it's really the, the work ethic that I would probably uh, suggest. Now, he um, was very interested in the political part of his career. And the political part, uh, of course, got him fascinating clients. Uh, so it was good for his law practice. And the fact that he was a brilliant lawyer was wonderful for his political career because everybody wanted to be on the good side of Ram Jethmati because so many of them were corrupt. They figure eventually they were gonna need him. Uh, so so there, was a, there was a lot of synergy uh, uh, between those. And the political career, of course, got him a huge amount of press. Uh, and that was good for his legal career. Uh, when he was a schoolboy, about, probably about high school, well, high school, he almost skipped, but early, early high school, let's say, he was a wonderful debater. He was a brilliant debater. And so he would get on TV and, you know, he'd get on the nine o'clock show. I keep forgetting whose who's, uh, news show it was at nine o'clock for all those years. Uh, but anyhow, these, these young smart, smart alecky uh, uh, news hosts would get Ram on and they'd think they were gonna debate Ram Chetman <laughs> and it would just get slammed, I mean, completely slammed. There was no way he'd make fools out of them completely. Uh, so that, I mean, I can't advise anybody. Either you have that ability and talent or you don't. But definitely, Detail orientation, self-reliance, courage are things that really stand out in his personality. So uh, Dr. Edelman, that brings me to my last question. And I love asking this question. Um, what are you currently reading? And what are two books that you would suggest to someone who enjoyed reading yours? Well, uh, at the moment, uh, I'm, I'm taking a little break. I've just written two more books since this book. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so my most recent book has just come out. So my my subsequent books were uh, the, the next one was the title was After Saturday Comes Sunday, and I tell this story about the last living people to still speak the Aramaic language, which was the language spoken by Christ in the Holy Land, and the last major uh, communities to speak that language are the Chaldean Christians. Aramaic Christians and the Kurdish Jews. And I tell their story, uh, the, the persecutions uh, and their history. Uh, that, was, that came out of, a few years ago. And then one that just came out in February, uh, the title is From Jerusalem to Delhi Through Persia. And I strongly recommend that to, to the, your, uh, your audience, particularly from South Asia, because in that, I make the argument that there's an incredible attraction between Jews and Indians, between 
uh, Israel and India. It goes in both directions. And I'm, I make the argument that it's not just the, the, the kids who finish their, their military service in Israel that decide to put on a backpack and go to India and smoke dope, but it's much deeper than that. And that in fact, it goes back to the ancient Persian empires that united us both, united the Middle East to India all the way, well, at least to the Indus River. river. And through that bridge, traveled religions, legends, gods, languages, uh, ethics, and, and so forth, and also mediated through the Zoroastrian religion, which shared a huge amount philosophically with Judaism, and which grew up in parallel with Hinduism. And the writings were all at about the same time, and many of the names of gods are the same. And I described these, these many, many parallels between Zoroastrianism and Judaism, and Zoroastrianism and Hinduism, and so it's very apropos, uh, that one particularly is very apropos to, to this book. It, both the, the last two books were both published by Gorgias Press, G-O-R-G-I-A-S Press, and uh, are a little cheaper if you, if you contact Gorgias Press uh, to order them than going through Amazon. Amazon is Amazon, you know, they, they do what they want. But uh, you can get them both through Gorgias Press and Amazon. Both books sound incredibly interesting. Dr. Edelman, thank you so much for joining us for your time. And it has been so insightful to speak to you. And thank you once again. Thank you so much. I appreciate this. Is there some way I could get the recording? <laughs>